So now we come to the part where I hope everybody did the reading. I'm um, okay. Okay, that's good. That's good. Um, so everything bad is good for you by Stephen Johnson. How popular culture is actually making us smarter. Uh, it's a good book. It's a quick, easy read. Hopefully nobody had any hard times with it. And so to return to earlier areas of television, you generally see that the theme is increasing complexity over time. Earlier eras had linear stories, one story per episode. That's it. If that wasn't simple enough, early TV used to use what Johnson calls flashing arrows. So cinematic techniques used to bring some object or situation to the attention of the viewers. They make it really, really, really easy for you to follow along and make it really hard for you to miss it. Because again, you might not be paying attention, you might be doing something else, or you might be new to television. They had to work very hard to develop the complex language that we today take for granted. We grew up with a visual film and TV vocabulary. But one of the other things you see about the early modernist television is suspension of disbelief. So let's actually diagram some narratives and see what we get, just like Johnson does in the book. Um, every episode of Dragnet is very, very simple. It's Joe Friday's story. The first voice we hear is his, and we stick with his point of view throughout the episode. We follow him as he learns of the crimes, interviews the witnesses, and catches the crook. Every episode follows the same linear format, always following Joe Friday. No cold opens, there are no flashbacks, there are no flash forwards, and the audience can't even fathom the idea of a flash sideways yet. Okay, but early television isn't always that simple. Dragnet is very simple even for early television. Eventually, writers discover the B-plot, a second story which is cross-cut with the main A-plot. In early television, the two threads are mostly disconnected from each other, involving different stories and different characters, all functioning independently. There were two different episodes that got spliced together, but they're not really connected. They exist in their own spaces each. You could have taken each one of them and said, well, let's make an episode out of this. And instead of just having one, you had two. But again, no flashbacks, no nonlinearities, no realities within realities. Simple stories about simple humans. Postmodernist television is different. We start to have an increase in complexity. Flashbacks are now allowable. There can be multiple protagonists, each traversing their own narrative thread. And we see a lot of deconstruction of earlier paradigms, so a suspicion towards stories, a constant reminder that what I'm hearing isn't necessarily real. Early modernist television, you just want to turn, sit down and turn off every year distractions and enjoy yourself. Postmodernist television, you want to engage more actively in it. So let's look at the postmodern sitcom Seinfeld. In almost every episode, several story threads are presented at the beginning, generally involving characters in separate and unrelated situations, which then converge and are interwoven towards the end of the episode in an ironic fashion. So, metamodernism continues the trend of increasing complexity. In fact, we now, not only are we allowed to have flashbacks, you can have flash forwards, flash sideways, stories within stories, plays within plays, TV shows within TV shows. Char things take place in characters' imaginations. Where modernist sis was about suspending disbelief, and postmodernism was about deconstructing belief and suspension of disbelief, metamodernism is a little more playful. It involves a suspension of suspension of disbelief. That is to say, your TV show will increasingly remind you that it's not real. In the middle of suspending disbelief, it will come and point out to you, I'm not real, I'm pretend. So let me show what I, what I mean by some of this. Take Lost. In every episode of Lost, a main character is involved in two different places in time. The narrative jumps back and forth between a present narrative and a relevant flashback, or a flash forward, or a flash sideways, or whatever. And the two different narratives echo each other in interesting ways. So this is different than an A plot and a B plot. But this is Jose Chung. To comprehend the work, the audience has to parse the episode into some kind of comprehensible narrative structure. And in this simplified diagram, we have 13 different points of view. And that's me trying to be simple. A more complex diagram could be made. How can you help an audience 
make sense out of this, especially a 1990s audience? How do you keep this episode from becoming a tangled and indecipherable mess? Well, they figured out how. One trick they used were kicks. Kicks that could instantly draw the viewer out of the narrative flow and into a higher narrative. And so a kick is sort of a suspension of suspension of disbelief. It's intentionally unreal. Writer Darren Morgan previously used a kick of sorts in the episode War of the Copperphages. One minute you're watching an X-Files episode about killer cockroaches, but suddenly you see a shadow. A large bug is crawling across your television screen. One moment you're happily entranced by the X-Files, comfortable in your suspension of disbelief, and the kick intentionally knocks you out of the narrative thread. Sort of like a radioactive decay, maybe. The roach on the screen kicks you out of the X-Files and back into real life. And in Jose Chung, kicks transport the viewers between narrative threads. Jose Chung does this a lot. Jose Chung kicks us out of the flow by the intentional balderdization of profanity. One minute we're in a scully flashback, and then the word bleep is used, and it kicks us out of scully's flashback and back into the earlier stage of Scully's interview with Jose Chung. In other cases, Jose Chung uses a cutless jump cut. So a scene change without a cut. So one minute Harold is being interviewed by police. He looks down. Then he looks up. There's no cut. But now he's being interviewed by Mulder and Scully. So we have one of these two when Rocky talks to the men in black. One minute he's talking to the men in black. He looks down. And then he looks back up again and he's talking to Mulder and Scully. The flashback to the men in black uses a whip pan. A whip pan approximates experience of the human eye as it moves from one subject to another. A whip pan is usually used to imply that intercutting scenes are used at the same moment. Seeing Lord Kinboat deliver his ridiculous lines kicks us out of Rocky's flashback. Baldur's skepticism kicks us out of Scully's flashback and into Chung's interview with Scully. Blaine's absurd observations also serve to kick us out of the narrative thread. Jillian Anderson's hair was dyed for the role of Scully, with shades varying between seasons. Hyper-scrutiny of Anderson's appearance reportedly led to questions of whether her hair was a little too red. In the same scene, Blaine recalls Mulder screaming. In War of the Copperphage, is also by Darren Morgan, Scully jokingly inquires if Mulder has a girly scream. In Blaine's retelling, this girly scream actually makes an appearance. Even the music serves to kick you out of flow. The X-Files theme itself is included in the episode, and a variation of similar tone is used in the background of Dead Alien Truth or Humbug. The concluding moments of the episode included the actual X-Files theme with one note tweaked. In addition to kicks, we also have glitches in the Matrix, moments where earlier text is reused in novel contexts. Darren Morgan used glitches in his earlier works. In the Episode Humbug, Scully looks at a picture of the Alligator Man and says, Imagine going through your whole life looking like that. In the closing scene, a freak looks at Mulder and makes the exact same observation. It's the same line, but in completely opposite contexts. Morgan also used a glitch in War of the Copperphages. Early in the episode, Scully warns, Don't look too hard, you might not like what you find. And Mulder observes, Isn't that what Dr. Zayas said to Charlton Heston at the end of Planet of the Apes? In the closing scene, Mulder asks the scientists, What do you hope to find from it? Bambi replies, His destiny. And Ivanov observes, Isn't that what Dr. Zayas said to Zira at the end of Planet of the Apes? The same lines are reused in a different context, and they resonate and echo with each other. The reused lines bend your understanding across time, and Jose Chung's glitches echo across narrative threads. Jose Chung has a lot of this sort of thing. There are three interrogation scenes with similar lines and similar staging. There are three hypnosis scenes with similar lines and similar staging. There are three instances where a shadow of an alien head enters the frame. Chung, Rocky, and Blaine each say the line, I know how crazy this is going to sound. A dead man comes up five different times. And three instances of how the hell should I know. In total, there's some 27 instances of kicks or glitches in Jose Chung, for an average instance of once every two minutes. 
To comprehend the work, the audience has to parse the episode into a comprehensible narrative structure. So look how far we've come. TV was once decried as a wasteland for a procession of formulaic comedies about totally unbelievable families. The first TV shows were a pablum of homogeneity. But by the mid-90s, TV had evolved. Jose Chung is a complex network of intertextual references, deep textual allusions, intersecting threads. Its complexity is a harbinger of the future of television.